To many, Alfa Romeo has always been more than a car manufacturer. Its cars are more than ordinary. They defy conventions. They evoke memories of racing's golden era. It's about passion and enthusiasm. Alfa Romeo's appeal more to the heart than to the head. It's about the spirit of the open road, the adventure of driving, and the combination of performance and beauty. Alfa Romeo's name evokes images of driving pleasure, sporty, stylish cars that are at home in the city or out on a twisty road. These are cars with a racing pedigree that can still be felt in today's road machines. They're produced by a company where heritage is important. To understand today's Alfa Romeos, one must step back into the past. These Italian icons were forged in the crucible of racing. Alfa Romeos have taken part in competitions since the company was founded in 1910. The company, Antonima, Lombardo, Fabrica, Automobili, or Alfa, took the cars right from its factory in Milan to the track. Racing wins helped to sell cars. As World War I began, Alfa joined the group of companies controlled by industrialist Nicola Romeo. Alfa Romeo was born. After the war, Romeo assembled a talented team of engineers, designers and drivers to take the company to new heights. In 1923, his talented racing team manager, Enzo Ferrari, snatched Turin-born designer Vittorio Jano from Fiat. Together, they launched a new era for Alfa Romeo. Jano immediately made his mark with the P2. This car was undefeated for seven years and became a motorsports legend. This supercharged eight-cylinder racer took the checkered flag in its first race in 1924. The crowd thought its 158 kilometers per hour average speed was incredible. The Alfa Romeo team kept winning race after race. The team won the Targa Florio road race at the International Grand Prix in 1924 and 1925. They earned the company the World Championship title. As they kept winning, they became heroes. Antonio Ascari, Achille Vasi, Giuseppe Campari, and Tazio Nuvolari were like rock stars today. One driver shone above the rest, Nuvolari. Ferdinand Porsche said that Nuvolari was the best driver in the past present and future. Jano's new cars kept the team in the winner's circle. In 1927, the lively 6C1500 was introduced as a sporty production car, but its racing ability was soon tested. These cars dominated the sports racing category until 1931. The spectacular 8C2300 replaced the 6C in 1931, and Alfa Romeo's command of the track continued. These cars are considered to be some of the greatest designs of the early 1930s. They're lively, well-handling, precise automobiles that were very successful in long-distance racing. 
They had supercharged eight-cylinder engines that were basically two four-cylinder blocks mated together. The engine was paired with several different chassis designed for different types of races. It was hoped that racing wins would stimulate sales of the other production cars the company continued to build. After the car lost its first race in 1931, the Mille Miglia, Nuvolari took the 8C to the Targa Florian. He faced his former teammate, Vazzi, who had joined Bugatti. Vazzi had lightened his car by removing the mudguards and took the lead. Enzo Ferrari had also lightened the Alphas, but sensing rain, he only removed the rear mudguards. Ferrari was right, and the rain started to fall. The course turned into a mud bath, and Vazzi was in trouble. Nuvolari passed him by and sailed on to capture first plate. More wins followed, and these became the all-conquering race cars of their day. Not everyone raced these cars. An Italian ice merchant, Giulia Rimaldi, bought this Alfa and kept it for nearly 50 years. He was a well-known character driving around town in his Alfa, adorned with ice chests sitting on the running boards. After he died, this very rare car was first sold for $2.9 million. It was later sold for less after the market for collector cars crashed in the late 1980s. The current owner was able to pick up this car for only $1.8 million. It's a car that will probably continue to increase in value as people become more astute about investing in rare automobiles. In the meantime, its owner will no doubt have the joy of driving a legend. In 1932, Alfa dominated the racing scene with its new car, the P3. This is considered to be Jarno's triumph. Six models were produced. Its first race at Monza on June 5th turned into another triumph for Alfa. They went on to win the Italian Grand Prix, the French Grand Prix, the Capacciano, and the Coppa Serpo. The cars were so successful that Alfa felt it could rest on its laurels. The company withdrew from racing. In 1933, the team continued under the prancing horse banner of manager Enzo Ferrari. Nuvolari won seven races, but tragedy struck when two of his teammates were killed. The graceful P3s were full of Jano's innovations and Ferrari was determined to use these cars to keep winning races. Soon, Ferrari would be a name to contend with. The P3s continued to win at the Mille Miglia and Le Mans, but the cars were beginning to be overshadowed by the well-financed German Grand Prix teams of Auto Union and Mercedes. The German cars were formidable opponents that combined high-powered engines streamlined styling, and the engineering talent of two major manufacturers bent on dominating Grand Prix racing. Mercedes and Auto Union seemed unbeatable. Attendance at races mushroomed as these two teams took over Grand Prix racing. More than 300,000 spectators turned out for every race. Today, 60 or 80,000 is considered to be a big crowd. The biggest race of all was the German Grand Prix. It was assumed that Auto Union or Mercedes would claim a victory on their home turf at the 1935 German Grand Prix. Nuvolari decided to pit his skills as a driver against the machines of the two racing powerhouses. He decided to be the tortoise that never stops to the relentless German hare. The huge crowd didn't give Nuvolari and his teammates in their three outdated Alphas much of a chance to defeat the mighty Germans. 
Nuvolari played the tortoise and kept after the race leader, Manfred von Brauhitsch, who couldn't shake the persistent Italian. As the race rolled on, it appeared von Brauhitsch would score another victory for Germany. Then, in the last miles of the last lap, the German hare stumbled when one of his rear tires blew out. Nuvolari, the tortoise, passed him to take the checkered flag. This is considered to be one of the greatest racing victories of all time. Ironically, Tazio Nuvolari would eventually join the Outer Union team, but he is best remembered for his victory in the 1935 German Grand Prix. Even though the Germans owned Grand Prix racing, Alpha's racing glory wasn't over. There was still room in the sports car class, thanks to a new car, the SC2900, introduced in 1935. The 2.9 was the pinnacle of Alpha's pre-war development. Its victories ignited the imaginations of young boys around the world, including Phil Hill, who would become a racing legend. After reading exciting stories in magazines and books, he wanted to own an 8C 2.9 Alfa Romeo. While these cars and their predecessors dominated professional European sports car racing during the 1930s, a fan could buy one of these great cars directly from the factory and challenge the pro. All you had to do was buy a car. You could compete without having to become a racing wizard. Wizard or not, if you were a great driver, you could even beat the factory teams. In fact, that's what happened with the 2.9 that we see Phil Hill driving here. Piero Ducio, much like Phil Hill, in later years, had to have a 2.9. He purchased one on June 18th, 1937 and quickly had it outfitted for racing. Ducio became known for his love of slippery, race-ready cars. Ducio went on to form the Sicitalia Car Company. It became famous for building sports and racing cars in the late 40s and early 50s. But he got his start in this 2.9 Alfa Romeo. In its inaugural race, Ducio's Alfa took second in between two Alfa team cars. He then entered the thousand-mile Italian road race, the Mili Miglia. This car that we see here came in third behind two of the Alfa Romeo team cars. It then beat those cars in a hill climb race. Ducio retired the car from racing and he had a body built for it by Pininfarina. The long hood, short rear deck and sleek pontoon fenders created a harmonious and balanced look that appealed to the most discriminating automotive experts. Alpha built only 37 of the 2.9s and this remarkable one-of-a-kind car with its racing pedigree was sold by Christie's at auction for more than five million dollars. To many, the 2.9 Alpha is still the car that dreams are made of. When war broke out, there was no more time to dream about the simple pleasures of life, like racing. Italy and the rest of the world was engulfed by World War II. During the war, Alpha, like most auto companies, turned its attention to military production. The war devastated the country and its industrial base. Lives, homes, and factories were destroyed. It would take years to put the pieces back together. After the war, as the company struggled to get back on its feet, racers like Phil Hill started to campaign some of the Alpha pre-war cars. Hill was able to finally buy the 2.9 that he'd always dreamed about. It was a car that had won the Mili Miglia in 1938. He took it racing at Pebble Beach in California in 1951. He'd raced and won in a new Jaguar the previous year, but felt that the 13-year-old Alpha was more sophisticated. 
it was more powerful and felt like a real race car. While he didn't win, this rare car is estimated to be worth between five and six million dollars today. Hill sold it for $4,000 in 1951. The company also reached back to its pre-war cars and started to race the 158 in 1946, a car it first introduced in 1938. The 158 was affectionately called the Alfetta. It was a small but agile car with a slender and elegant style. The Alfetta helped Alfa attract one Manuel Fangio to its team. And at Monaco, he launched his campaign that led to eight victories that year. A nine-car pileup on the first lap cut the field in half, but Fangio came through it and won. The next year, Alfa modified the car and gave the engine more power. It was now called the Type 159, and Fangio took it out on the world's race circuits. An ironic event in motoring history occurred at the British Grand Prix. The former head of Alfa's racing team, Enzo Ferrari, had launched his own car company, and his new cars beat the Alfa Romeo. While Fangio would go on to win the World Championship in 1951, Alfa Romeo's racing days were numbered. In 1952, when the Formula One regulations changed, Alfa decided to withdraw from the Grand Prix circuit instead of building a new engine. Fangio, like Nuvolari before him, went on to win races for other teams. Alfa concentrated their efforts on building road cars. The company had been nationalized and the government wanted it to concentrate on building passenger cars, not racing. But all of the cars that Alfa built were still sporty, including the 1900, its first all-new car after the war. The 1900 only had a four-cylinder engine, but its 1884 cc's gave it surprising performance. Its simple but functional styling retained some of the classic Alpha design cues like the radiator grill. The 1900 proved to be popular and spawned several different body styles, even an off-road model. While sedans had a certain appeal, the yearning for sporty performance drove the development of a new car. In 1955, the Giulietta made its debut. This small two-door car put Alfa's heart and passion back on the road. While they may not have been able to compete with Ferraris on the track, the car's design could hold its own when parked beside one. Some of the best design firms in Italy, Pininfarina, Bertoni and Zagato, created distinctive bodies for the car. These cars always looked like they were going fast, even when standing still. The Giuliettas were great image builders for the company. They embodied the exuberant Italian spirit that showed a certain fondness for life. Whether in the city or out on the open road, they compelled you to run flat out. The success of the cars showed that if you're going to build something, you should do it with style. These stylish and fun cars are still popular with collectors. They're a good choice for people who want to experience the fun of drop-top driving without having to take out a second mortgage. The Giulietta was replaced by the Giulia in 1963. This high-performance car lent itself to serving as the base for several racing versions. A modified Julia, the TZ, made its mark in grand touring races. Its scrappy 112 brake horsepower engine was put to the test 
at the FSIA Cup in Monza in 1963, at the Sebring 12-hour race, the 48th Targa Florio, the Le Mans 24-hour race, the Tour of France, the Coupe des Alpes, and the Tour of Corsica. It gave Alpha fans something to cheer about. This ability to compete showed that the TZ was a car ideally suited for both track racing and for road circuits. It brought back memories of Alpha's glory days on the track. The GTA model followed in 1965. Its riveted aluminum body by Batoni is considered to be a masterpiece. It gave a contemporary look and it significantly reduced the car's weight. The lightweight body and 2,000cc engine pushed the car to over 240 kilometers per hour. This performance took Alpha to the winner's circle at the European Challenge in 1966 67 and 68. What is probably the most famous modern day Alpha, the Duetto Spider, brought the world to attention when it was launched at the 1966 Geneva Motor Show. The Spider borrowed much of the heritage of the Giulietta and the Giulia, but gave car lovers a fresh look that proved to be long lasting. It remained in production for 26 years. Its distinctive features and shape became classics. While it went through several design changes, it's the car that comes to most people's minds today when you ask, what is an Alpha? Especially when they think about the opening shot of the film, The Graduate, where Dustin Hoffman is seen driving an Alpha Spider. The classic shape eventually gave way to more modern designs. Unfortunately, the strength of the Spider was not enough to keep the car company from falling into the takeover web. The Fiat Auto Group outbid Ford for Alfa Romeo and added this legendary brand to its growing lineup of auto companies, which include the famous company started by Alfa's former racing team manager, Ferrari. While some bemoan seeing Alpha taken over and feel that Goliath somehow has secured the upper hand against this David, others are happy to see the company survive. The takeover has given Alpha the financial resources to revitalize its product line. Newer and better cars started to appear that earned favorable reviews by the motor press. These new cars still share the legacy of the many classic Alfa Romeos that have delighted fans since the first cars left the factory in 1910. There is still a sense of fun and a desire to experience a lively and passionate encounter with the open road. These are cars for people who appreciate style and performance. But it's the classic Alfa Romeos that ignite the hearts of car lovers all over the world who still dream about the heroic exploits of dashing racers who piloted these cars to glory. They close their eyes and see the beautiful post-war cars that were made for the lovers of life and the open road. To all of these fans, Alfa Romeo remains one of the world's great cars.